in Europe and Asia and so on, depending which commercial risk rating agency to the line. So I put like 50 to 60, but just to to, to suggest um, how 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 these can be uh, shown. They, um, the height of the column is the level of governance, is determined by minus 2.5, plus 2.5, that's a range, maximum and minimum. Um, in, in standard deviation units, we will determine them. Um, but associated with each column, you see a thin line at the top that's kind of the margin of error. So that means the good, the, the bad news, quote unquote, the sober news is that uh, one ought not try to run the precise horse races and pretend that one <coughs> that that Sweden is better than than Finland, basically. This is a statistical type because it's within the margin of error or New Zealand and so on. They're all in the same group. Um, that that uh, action basically segment the world into different categories, five, six different categories where they are significantly, substantially different from the others. The green is being different than the yellows, the ye yellows different than the other, other color. By the way, Turkey comes out. The here we will we'll get back to that that issue. But they are very far from the countries in, in huge governance crisis like the Somalias and Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, Iraq, Angola, Venezuela, and, 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 and so on. Another way of looking at the data is through a governance map. In this, in this case, it's a different. Um, different dimension, we put rule of law. If it looks to you as a cut and paste from the web, it is, because it's all from the website and one goes to the governance map and, and you can do it. And one of the things that's disturbing clear when one does this exercise with maps is the enormous variance um, in, in governance around the world, but even within the same, um, within the same continent. We take my own country, and you can tell I'm biased, and I'm from Chile. Um, you have a whole spectrum within one continent between a green country, meaning that they are in the in the top group in terms of governance, control of corruption, very much like the the better countries in OECD, in Europe, and so on, um, all the way to the Venezuelas and so on, which are in red. So this whole notion we are so used about reading and writing, which is to generalize about continents, it can be basically challenged very much when one looks carefully at the data because you have had such enormous variation. So in Africa, control of corruption, we have green too. Of course, we have many countries in crisis there <coughs> in Central Africa, but there is green. And if one starts looking and inching towards Europe, not everything is it's very green, like you can tell which country it is, but I'm not going to get into the details. But uh, anyway, the same about the Middle East, we see lots of challenges and, and differences. This is another way of, again, showing the data, just to show a bit <coughs> more focus for some countries and groups of countries. So obviously, the Nordics lead the world by example in terms of all governance dimensions. It is not the US, a contrary to to believe are not the main superpower who necessarily exhibit the best, they are the best models in terms of governance. US usually is about number 20 to 30 in the world in, in terms of many of these indicators. They vary depending on which one. But in terms of control of corruption, it would, it would not be. So here it is. So here, it's like Turkey, it's where Brazil is. The difference is not statistically. Uh, very significant, a bit below the, the new European, recent other European countries that accessed from Eastern Europe in, in, par in particular. They are much better, obviously, than, than China and, and Russia and like the Venezuela of this world. But then there are others, and the Nordics are at a different level altogether. Now you may say, well, this is kind of interesting and so on, but how do you know that this matters? So this is interesting data, does it really matter? And we've done quite a bit of work 
And by now it's not just us, other academic, about the extent from an empirical standpoint, with a lot of data, the extent to which institutions and governments does matter for all kinds of economic uh, results. One very basic result, and I'm, I'm showing it in a very simplistic fashion, but we have done the, the peer review research, peer review papers and so on, showing that what we call the 300 development dividend, a 300% development dividend from improving uh, governance. Essentially, we find on average, and with our data methodology, but also applying the approaches from other scholars that have written paper that, we find that on, on average, a country that improves uh, governance dimensions like rule of law, control of corruption, and so by one standard deviation, and I'll, I'll illustrate that, that is associated with a threefold increase in per capita income for that country in the long term. It takes a long time until all the fruits of that reform or that improvement in rule of law and control of corruption comes. So it's a long run result at 300%. But 300% is enormous. A country that today has $10,000 per capita income, in the longer term can expect $30,000 by improving this. Uh, in, in, in these dimensions in, in governance. They, this is a causal link, and we, we have provided an approach and a technique to, to suggest that it is a causal, causal uh, result going from improving governance to higher incomes and not in the reverse. It's, there's a whole debate whether the reverse applies or not, but aside from that debate, we show it in that in the direction from better governance to, to a higher income. We're showing it also in terms of reduction of infant mortality, higher literacy rate, and, uh, and, and, and so on. And this is controlling for other factors. This shows in a very simplistic fashion that type of uh, linkage. But the, the importance doesn't stop at, at such an aggregate level and only income. So one looks, for instance, at the World Economic Forum, which every year rank, ranks countries in terms of their global competitiveness. Uh, they basically run countries after, after doing their, their survey of enterprises and other factors that they include. They rank 139 countries. Uh, Turkey, you may know, or not, uh, Turkey in the last um, rating ranked number 61 out of 139. You would know much better because of the discussion of the glass being half full or half empty, but it's 61. Uh, a key pillar in terms of that ranking is the quality of governance or the quality of ins institutions, where, in fact, in that pillar, it's well below even that average 61. It's the 88, so it's be basically below the middle of the, of the pack in terms of of, of 60, 61, while on, on other areas, innovation, sophistication factor, and also market size, for instance, and so on, it's well above, and that's how the 61 comes about. So it does suggest, in fact, among all the main pillars that, that they look at, that institutions is, is very, very important. And in fact, if we look at this link, we see this is quite telling, I suggest to you that very least. We take our governance indicator, let's say rule of law, 2009, and we map it in a plot ground for the whole world against a completely separate indicator that the World Economic Forum does for the Global Competitive Index. We see, first of all, that there's an incredibly high correlation, even though those are two different data sets in this point of point 0.85, and that um, Turkey is near the line. And here, here, here it is, and uh, around where basically Brazil is in their, in their respects, and much better than many other countries in the world, but obviously there are 60 or so other countries that are, are above it on, on, uh, on the competitive, competitive side. So this is issue of competitiveness. Another area where governance matters enormously is in public finances, and I know some of you work on that issue. And one piece of research 
I, I was embarking recently is in asking the following question. You see, in so many years at the World Bank, I had to focus, and I was very committed to focus on, on the problem of governance and corruption in developing countries. But once I, I graduated from the World Bank and I moved to Brookings Institution, the wonderful thing about being in a think tank is that I can worry and research those issues about any country in the world. So I asked the question, A, what about a richer world in terms of corruption? Is it an issue in industrialized countries? And B, if so, does it matter? So we knew about development, and we showed a 300% good governance dividend and so on. But what about the virtue? And it was, to be perfectly frank, it was very surprising, even to me, although I had done so much in critical work, how much variance there is in some governance dimensions within the richer world. So even if one just looks at OECD countries and the, <coughs> basically the, the regional set of OECD countries. It was a very close link, and I did some regression with a bit of causality test and so on, showing a clear link between the extent to which a country is successful in controlling corruption on the one hand and the macroeconomics fiscal balance on, on the other hand. And this was at the time of the Greek crisis. So the Wall Street Journal put a big article in the first place with the issue on Greece very prominently here and uh, with, with, uh, with, with the issues, as opposed to the Finns, the Denmark, and the Sweden, and so on. So, I mean, there are many mechanisms by which this <coughs> uh, is suggested to work with, from tax uh, mobilization to they, they basically that, 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 is, that is lacking and so on, and the links to corruption and so on. But the bottom line is that the, the whole issue of some of these macroeconomic crises cannot be looked only in terms of economic factors driving it. So the whole issue of the political economy and, and corruption issue come, comes in. We'll revisit that before I end with, with an example about the uh, the, the U.S., but let me suggest quickly before that that one, with this data one can also not only ask questions about what's happening at the point in time, but also what's been happening over time. So, so far the analysis and the presentation has been um, at the point in, in time. But one, since we have data from the late 90s, one can already uh, do quite a bit of analysis for over a dozen, or about a dozen uh, years. Um, always, this is again generated from the web itself. It's a copy and paste. Always by default, the top, the top bar for any dimension will be the most recent data point. So on the bottom, you choose which one we want. So if we want part of the possible, in terms of of the excuse that one finds sometimes that only the very rich countries can eventually afford to have good governance. As if the causality direction goes the other way around and income are going to solve the problem of governance. Well, not so. In fact, in Chile, we are still an emerging economy, not very high per capita income, but it, it is already three times higher than it was 20 years ago. So we are. We're seeing the fruits of, of, of that. We have, a, we exhibit much higher levels of governance than a number of uh, countries in Europe, uh, uh, for, for instance. Here's another way of seeing changes over time. And uh, because we have the margins of error, we can also do the analysis. When is a change meaningful or significant in a statistical sense, and when it is not? In these type of writings, and not only this, but too often, there's too much elevator economics. A minor change from last year is blown out of proportion and, uh, and over-interpreted. Because we know what the uncertainty is, the marginal 